so which moved it so thank you sir again uh, for joining us and uh, uh, as i told today is going to be a dozen questions and uh, we're going to run through a lot of topics through this session so my very first uh, question would be about your journey through photography uh, because uh, to put things in perspective for uh, those of you who are not really aware of uh, dinesh sir's uh, journey uh, he is a, a graduate of uh, with economics degree from delhi university after which in contrast to the degree he has done all kinds of odd jobs like uh, cal he has sold calculators in chavri bazar he has done quality check in garments in uh, faridabad factory and he has cleared tables as a bus boy in uh, upper east side bar in new york and he calls those experiences as his best education compared to what he learned in his uh, college uh, during the degree so uh, it has been a very um, dynamic uh, journey and finally ends up being a photographer and he's been doing it and doing it so well for the last 30 years so my question uh, very first question would be about your journey sir if you could take us through how it came about to be okay uh, thank you very much both for inviting me here and i am really honored to be amongst all of you uh, thank you for taking time out to listen to this conversation and i hope it won't be too boring and tedious for you uh, i will be sharing work Uh, based on the cues which both will provide in terms of questions he puts forth to me. Uh, okay, I'll keep. I'm going to keep the beginning part short. It is can be a long story too, which if anyone's interested in the details, you can go on to my stop talk, uh, which is on YouTube. Uh, well, it really started a long time ago. It started with the fact that my father was a photographer. Uh, so even while I was in school and college, I had access to a camera, to film rolls, and we even had a dark room at home, uh, which at that time you can imagine when you know uh, in India in the 70s and 80s, uh, cameras were expensive, if not impossible to get. Uh, film was of course very expensive to get it, to buy film, to process it, to make prints. Uh, wasn't the easiest thing for someone who would be in school and college. So that I really think was a head start for me. uh that plus coupled with the fact that i learned the basics of things like the exposure triangle etc from my father and uh, to his credit he was never someone who forced photography on me but kind of just gently you know provided me the opportunity to play with it uh, which is something which you know i when i look back i really respect that uh, because you know as parents and i'm a parent now of two daughters uh, and that's a lesson i've learned in terms of parenting too is so you have to let your children be you have to let them do what they want to do uh, and the only role as a parent you ought to be playing is to nurture them and to kind of nudge them along and help them in areas which they seem to find interest in so that's what my father had done for me uh, so one was of course learning the basics of photography the other of course was that he even used to give me the opportunity uh, as i got into the earlier years of college to you know borrow a camera from him get take one or two black and white rolls and go off to you know on the weekend to go to rishikesh or go to jaipur or go to agra you know these are all cities within about 100 200 kilometers from delhi uh, transport wasn't so easy that time so i used to travel in state transport buses take a train but that was my exposure to one to photography two also to my country in a way uh, and very importantly my you know interest in travel and seeing the world other than what my family was or my, what my home was is something which uh, you know became a very important cachet for me to carry forward in later life but having said that uh, when it came to a uh, time when i had to choose a career and like subodh pointed out i did uh, economics from delhi university i was very clear in my mind that i will not be a photographer and the reason for that was actually very simple but i don't know how it got into me but maybe it was when i studied economics when i'd also studied about the economics is the caste system and its ramifications on individuals and i felt that in india you know a person is forced to follow their parents or their father's footsteps uh, because of the caste system you know say if a father is a photographer the child, son becomes a photographer the father is a cobbler the son becomes a cobbler if the father has a shop you're supposed to go and sit in the shop with him and run it if your father had a factory then you you know inherited the factory and you ran that uh so 
I didn't want to be a victim of the caste system. So I was very clear in my mind, even at the age of 19 or 20, that I will not, I love photography, but I will not do it because I don't want to be a victim of the caste system. Big thoughts for a hmm. 20 year old, but uh, uh, that's the thing which, you know, was the bug in my head. Uh, so what to do then? You know, I was uh, not very clear. I was not a very great student, actually not a good student at all, because I was more interested in being with friends and, you know, just generally being social, etc. while I was in college. Uh, but the good thing for me was that I, amongst my friends, there were these two girls who used to study commercial art uh, in a polytechnic in Delhi. And I used to hang around with them and I, you know, used to watch them doing their assignments and doing their projects. And I found that really interesting, you know, when they used to work on, you know, dummy campaigns and dummy ads. And I thought, hey, this is a business I would like to be in. So I looked for a job in advertising, got one. And for the next 11 years, I was in advertising, not on the creative side, but on the client servicing side. And so 11 years from after college, I spent in advertising. I really enjoyed it. I worked for some very fine agencies called Clarion, Lintas, and Enterprise, which was the last one I worked for. And Enterprise was an agency. There were two agencies which were considered to be the most creative in India at that time in the uh, mid 80s. And uh, Enterprise was one of them. And I became the manager of the daily branch of Enterprise at the age of 28. And I was the youngest branch manager ever in advertising, so which I am very proud of when I look back at that. But having said that, once, you know, I had set up the branch, I was running it, and about three years into it, I started feeling that, look, the reason I used to enjoy advertising was because I like to work with creative people, I like to work on a brief, I like to work with the client. But as a manager, you end up now looking after the branch, you're looking after people, you know, you're hiring people, you're looking at profits, looking at growth. And that is something which I said, oh my God, this is not something which is my reason for being in advertising. So slowly my love for photography, which is always there, also started coming back. And I spoke to my boss, uh, one of the finest people you can think of. He was uh, the owner of Enterprise and also the creative director. His name is Mohammed Khan. And uh, Mohammed uh, said, listen, I fully understand what you want to do. You're most welcome to you. Tell me if there's any way I can help you and I will. Uh, but between Mohammed and I decided that, you know, they, I will leave the agency at a time when everything seems to be in control because there's always a client who's coming or a client who's going or some major campaign to be you know, worked on, etc. So about two years went by just, you know, getting things organized. But then I said, okay, enough. And in 1990, I quit advertising. I started as a photographer. Uh, now, the thing was that for me, because of my involvement with advertising, uh, my first understanding of the application of photography was commercial, uh, was for advertising. Uh, so because of that particular exposure, that's what I started working on. Uh, now, the thing was, though I learned the basics of photography, but the basics were really about natural light situations, shooting in the street, shooting candid. But commercial photography requires a lot more. It requires an understanding of light, an understanding of studio flashes, understanding of light metering. And that was the time when we were shooting on film, how to operate a four by five camera, how to work with the 120. I had no clue. I had no clue. I'd never even handled a light meter in my life. And this is only after I left Enterprise that I realized, look, all this I don't know. So anyway, fortunately, I had some art director friends who used to give me small assignments, the kinds where I wouldn't make a fool of myself, but I would also learn while, you know, working on them. And I used to practice a lot at home, you know, whatever kind of a plate, a glass, a fruit, some vegetables, any food, you know, I would into the night, I would put up a camera and I would, you know, try and light it, see where I was going right, where I was going wrong. Uh, so that's how the first year and a half or two went by. But so I was enjoying myself. I really liked what I was doing. I started to make a little money too. Fortunately, my wife was in also in advertising and she told me, hey, listen, don't worry. I have my salary at least. I'll, you know, run the house. Uh, but what I realized about a year or so down the road is that 
yes, I wanted to be a photographer. Yes, I'm happy being a photographer. But is this all I wanted to do with photography? Is it only that I want to shoot products? Is it only that I wanted to do advertising work? Is it only that I wanted to make money? And the answer to me was no, that's not all there was to me, uh, this for me. And along the way, there's a junior of mine who used to work with me in Lintas. He'd quit and he started you know, making uh, audio visuals. And he told me that he'd got an assignment to shoot the uh, in Tamil Nadu for the Tamil Nadu tourism. Uh, and the idea was to make, you know, travel for a month, go to all the holy places, all the temples, and all the tourist interest places, and make an audiovisual out of that. So he told me, would you be interested in doing that? I said, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm, you know. He said, Are yeah, if you quit uh, advertising and become a photographer, just take it up and let's go. And that's what we did. We got into an ambassador car in Chennai, which was Madras at that time. And for a month, we traveled all over the state of Tamil Nadu. Now, remember one thing, we were shooting on transparency film, all right? Mm -hmm. And that meant that for that 30 days we were out there, I was shooting, but I couldn't see one single image which I'd shot. And the only time I could see them, and I knew that, which is what used to make me very nervous, is when I'll come back all the way to Delhi after having spent 30 days on the road and send my roles to the lab for processing, would I be able to see, have I messed up? Or have I got some pictures which are worth his confidence in me? Fortunately, they were enough, which, uh, you know, we ended up making a good AV out of that. But the most interesting part for that, for me, was the fact that my interest in travel and travel photography was rekindled. If you remember what I mentioned, that even when I was in college, I used to get a chance to go to places like, you know, Jaipur and Agra and Pushkar, etc. Uh, so that's what I realized, you know, that there are two things which were very important for me as far as photography is concerned. One is, yes, I have to make a living from it. The other is that for me, photography was the way I would want to engage with things which interest me, which I love, which I find interesting, which I want to talk about, which I want to show. Uh, and that is something that got kindled by this one particular assignment. And I also was very clear and very aware in my mind that, you know, I was the kind of Indian who'd lived his life in Delhi, Bombay kind of places, which is a very small segment of India, actually. You know, this is this country which, in India, as a lot of you would know, uh, there are 100 Indians which live here, and there's 100 Indians which live at different time zones, virtually, you know. That's right. I mean, you can be living in a place like Delhi, but you go 100 kilometers and you find a village which is living the way it used to be 300 years ago or something. A country of and many countries. Was, yeah, yeah it's, it's many countries, it's many time zones, it's, it's many cultures. And that fascinates me. And I wanted to explore this country, you know. And it always in my mind at that time was that this is my country, but I'm a stranger to it. It belongs to me, but I don't seem to belong to it as much as I would want to. So therefore, for me, photography was this way of expressing myself about this country, which I wanted to go out and explore and find out why this was my country too. So over the next five or six years, whenever I had little money, which was always too short, and time, which is always a lot because it wasn't like I was getting so many assignments. Uh, so, you know, either I would go for a day, go for three days, go for a weekend, go for a week. Uh, but what I was really interested in I, uh, was to, I used to find, you know, dates for festivals, for melas, and in those six, seven years, then I traveled as much as I could all over India. And uh, I had my first solo exhibition in the NCPA Bombay in 96. And that exhibition then came to Delhi in 97, I think it was. And now the reason I'm telling you this long story is that, you know, lives are made of one is your intent. The other is serendipity. You know, things happen to you which are not in your control because it could be because of what you've been doing. But they come from outside. I, I believe in luck, not, and luck doesn't happen to people who just lie around and be lazy. But you have to be living a certain way to be able to then get people to notice what you're doing and provide you further opportunities with what you're doing. Uh, so David Davidar, who was the managing editor of uh, Penguin, 
he'd come for my exhibition in Delhi at the ISC. And a few days later, I get a call from his office saying that he and Vena, Vena is the head designer there, would like to meet me. So I said, sure. And I went over to the office and uh, David and Vena told me that, look, Penguin is actually a literary book company. That's what we're known for. But we feel that, you know, the time is right for us to do a few coffee table books and we want to start doing them, do one or two titles a year. And we really like your work and we are hoping that you'll be interested in doing a book. And I said, my God, you know, you tell a photographer that you want to do a book with you. You know, what more can I ask for? It's just the ultimate validation, you know, uh, for any photographer who does that kind of work. So anyway, so we were discussing what the book should be. And I was very clear that I didn't want to do the, you know, the traditional book on Rajasthan or the book on, you know, Madhya Pradesh or the book on the Ganga. But I wanted to do books which are a bit more interpretive, which are a bit more about my experience and my feelings about my country and different aspects of it. So I told them that let me just look at my archives. And I did for the next couple of months. And I found that there were these two very strong streams. Uh, and one was to do with the bazaar, which is the traditional markets of India. And the other, I've been very fascinated always by religion and faith. Uh, though I consider myself a non-believer but i have a tremendous respect and faith in the faith of others and i as a photographer really have been shooting that for the last 40 50 years really so anyway so to cut this story is already gone too long i was supposed to keep it short hmm. uh, in 2001 bazaar was published so between 97 when my exhibition happened and the book being published i uh, we decided that I have about 60-70% of the material the way I would want in the books. And I would spend another you know, two years after that going out and trying to fill up the gaps to make the story more wholesome the way I would want it to. So that's why then Bazaar was published in 2001 and uh, The Living Faith was published in 2004. So that's my story of how I became a photographer and why I have a certain approach to photography. So I continue to be a commercial photographer. In, through the decade of the 90s and the last 20 years of this century. I'm still very much a commercial photographer. I love that work, but I love travel. I love street. And that's my personal work. So the two coexist and go along merrily together. Thank you so much. So for if I may time. just add one yeah, or sure. two more uh, uh, things here. So eventually what I'm talking about is the fact that for me, photography is not about photography. It's not about cameras. It's not about lenses. It's not about chemistry. It's not about physics. Yes, all that is very important. But those are techniques. Those you can learn. Those anyone can learn. For me, photography is something which has to be a passion. It has to be a way of life. And what you have to understand is that what are you passionate about? It's the subjects which you want to shoot. It's the, whether it's a place, whether it's travel, whether it's architecture, whether it's food, discover that, find that. Because only then will you find that your photography is really enriched because it's really your love or your hate even for the subject which you are engaging with, which makes your photography really wholesome then. So that's the... Uh, thank you so much for taking us through that. Uh, it's wonderful to know always the backstory on uh, how it all happens. Uh, you mentioned that in 1990 is when you took up photography. Uh, in 1990, I was maybe six years old and learning ABC. So it's really wonderful <laughs> to know how far, uh, you know, how much of it. No, but Subodh, we were in the same. We were in the same boat. I was learning the ABC of photography. Yeah, yeah that's again true. That's again true. <laughs> we are a different kind of students of uh, life. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so it's wonderful to know. And also it's uh, quite interesting to know that you started in 1990 and your first book came out in 2001. That's 11 years. The second book came after 14 years. So all of us today in the modern generation, we want to release book in one year. Like we are already there, you know, it's something we need to understand that it takes time to build to a level where you can, you know, get to those points, you know, you need to be a bit patient, I guess. So uh, thank you for taking us through that. And uh, my second question would be about, again, your journey has been so long of 30 years and shooting so many kinds of stuff for uh, yes. clients where you shoot what they want and your personal work where you shoot what you want. So, and your journey still continues. You just told that you still go out and try to get new pictures. You still get new pictures in your home. So there's always that drive to create more and more and more. It's not like a short Rashtrapati Bhavan now lets me take a back step. No, you're always looking for something more. 
So I want Absolutely. to know that what keeps you, you know, what keeps that fire burning? Like uh, after so many years, how does that fire still burn? And second part of that question is, is there anything called retirement uh, in this particular <laughs> part? <laughs> <laughs> you know, people ask me that, uh, when, when, when do you want to retire? You know, I always say that I retired at the age of 33 and they look at me blankly because I'm 63 now. <laughs> so yeah, I, I retired from the corporate world at 33. Uh, I was in the management side. And thereafter, I took up a passion, which is photography. And fortunately for me, there's some people, some companies who wanted to pay me once in a while for doing my hobby. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've been retired for the last 30 years. It's just that I'm lucky that I get paid for <laughs> following my passion. Uh, but it's uh, photography is, like I said, it's, it's just not a profession alone. It's a passion. It's a way of life. It's my religion. It's... Uh, I don't see any reason why I should stop doing it. It's just I'm always still very hungry for the next photograph. And it's, I think, more to do with not the fact that I want to go through the act of photography. It's just that I'm, I think, very curious about things. I, I love things around me. I love, you know, seeing what's happening. I love light. I love how light plays with form. I love, uh, you know, activity. I've always seen, for instance, the street or any place I go, I look at it as a, as a theater. I look at the street as a theater of life. And I just, I find myself at times even now, more and more so, uh, that if I go to Banaras, for instance, and I'm sitting on the ghats, I might not even shoot a picture for the next two hours. I just watch people. That's right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's life is my passion. Photography is my expression of it. And I guess as long as there's life, there'll be photography. That's such a nice way to put it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, coming to the next uh, part of the question. Uh, also, you mentioned that uh, religion photography. I really like that line. Uh, I like that line so much that it's tattooed on my arm right now. You know, I, I call uh, it religion photography. Yeah. I saw it. I picked it up from there. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. So coming to the next part, which is uh, before we started the session, we were talking of uh, digital versus film. You know, uh, of those days and uh, these days, you know, uh, photography has literally exploded in the last uh, 10, 15 years at the most uh, since digital came in. And now with the mobile phones and mobile phones becoming so good, you know, it has literally taken to another level. Photography has uh, reached everyone and everyone is a photographer. So when you look at today's world uh, of this photography of this generation, and when you look at photography of the previous generation with the film camera, you told you shot for... Uh, uh, the Tamil Nadu tourism and you didn't even know what was going on till you came back and developed the film. So when you look at that, those two contrasts of photography, uh, is there something that we, the new generation, is missing when compared to your generation of doing film photography? Okay, I'm going to make two points here and I might sound a bit rude with what I'm going to say. but We like uh, rude. I'm we deal with Vinit Ora all the time. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I'm talking from my heart. I want to share with you the way I see things. And All right. So the thing with film uh, and when one was shooting in film uh, is that film itself is a very hard taskmaster. You know, film insisted that you first learn my chemistry. Film insisted that you first learn the physics of light. So, you know, and that was so unforgiving, unforgiving, and especially since I only shot color transparency. In that instant when you were shooting, everything had to be right in that because there was no correcting later. All right. Uh, so whether it's the composition, whether it's the frame, whether it's the moment, whether it's the expression, everything was imprinted onto that piece of celluloid in that instant forever. All right. So which meant that you had to have pre-visualized the situation you were going to photograph. And you had to have a very good understanding of how the exposure triangle, for instance, works and affects the picture which you're shooting. All right. That's one part of it. Two, which is also very important for people don't realize it. Photography cost money earlier. All right. It wasn't just the learning. It was every time you press the shutter, you spend about, in the case of color transparency film, I had calculated that 15 rupees per time you press the shutter. Because there was the cost of the film, there was the cost of the processing, then slides were to be mounted, all right? And if you were shooting on negative, then you were make, making contact sheets and making prints. 
so that in a way was a big filter or a big you know deterrent to shooting in a very promiscuous way which is what happens with digital digital actually we see it technically the only kharcha you have to do or the only expense you have to do is to go out buy a camera once That's you have the camera you actually if you look at it if you don't want to you don't need to spend another naya paisa and you can shoot in 100000 pictures after that all right so film made show because of the technical requirement of understanding how it works you had to be slow you have to understand you have to master it two because it cost money it held you back it taught you to be patient both these things taught you to be patient and in that time when you were learning the chemistry and the physics about of photography you also honed your eye it took you 2 3 4 years to understand how to handle film in that time you also understood very well how to light things you know where does light come from how does it make a difference if it comes from the top or from the side or from you know so all those things really were your teacher doing every shot was teaching you and then you looked at your contact sheets and looked at the transparencies very carefully to select which one you want and because it used to be expensive you only shot a couple of frames you didn't shoot a 100 frames of you know the same situation which is what we tend to do today That's so right. that is the one huge difference between film and digital the medium itself was your teacher the medium itself was your filter today with digital Uh, between the camera and between the algorithms within the camera or in the post processing capabilities you have on your computer a competent photograph is produced by something else you know you 90% of the time you will get a competent photograph it will be properly exposed won't be overexposed won't be underexposed and even if it were a bit there is always lightroom and photoshop to correct it you didn't have that option earlier so that makes you i think a bit careless all right number 2 i have a problem with people saying everyone's a photographer why according to me everyone is a camera owner not everyone's a photographer mm-hmm. that's right it's like if everyone owns a pen because everyone knows how to write and today everyone has a computer because you can be on the keyboard does everyone say i'm a writer no you don't according to me you say i have a camera i have a love for photography and i want to be a photographer if i was to give you an analogy you know if you want to be a doctor you don't say i'm a doctor the day you enter medical school you work your ass off for the next 5 years and become an mbbs and then you do a specialization and then 7 8 years later when you've done all that someone else tells you yes now you're ready to be a doctor all right and that is the respect people need to give to photography or for that matter any other art form all right you can want to be a kathak dancer my wife is a kathak dancer and i see her how she practices and how much riyas she does and you know how much effort she puts into it and only after many years she did, did she say that yes i am now ready to say i am a kathak dancer who will perform so that's the part i meant that i don't want to be rude but according to me everyone is a camera owner i'm sorry not everyone is a photographer you have to prove to me that you're a photographer up to say i see your work otherwise you're not sorry that's so true that's so true and i really like the way you put uh, chemistry and physics uh, in the explanation and as you were saying i was noting down uh, because you know as uh, when we used to go to uh, college there used to be the combination pcmb which is physics chemistry math and uh, biology yeah. yeah which i was useless i used to be horrified by them same year i was just <laughs> past 35 was my average always <laughs> but as you're saying that i remember pcmb and i also thought yes. like uh, during film days it was physics of light chemistry of film math of camera and biology of life all four together <laughs> perfect perfect so uh, moving to the uh, next uh, question uh, i have been exploring your website as i told i really love the way you organize things very easy to understand and run through everything that you have done almost because you're not updated for last two years so uh, as i was running through it uh, the most uh, Uh, the one which catches my most attention as i told earlier was the president's bodyguard and the rashtrapati bhavan which you shot because it's a real estate that we can't you know uh, just can't imagine of exploring you know maybe i know it's, it's, it's not it's not easy to get into yeah. yes maybe you can see it from far take a selfie but the getting into it and really knowing it from inside out under the skin of rashtrapati bhavan and it's like brilliant so i'm sure most of us are yeah. eager to know how that came about and also we would love to see the pictures 
Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, you know, the President's Bodyguard is one of the oldest regiments of the Indian Army. It, it, it actually dates back to, I think, about 1850s, 1860s or so. Uh, and its just main task, of course, is it's entrusted with the task of protecting the President. Uh, and since the President is based in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, so therefore the President's Bodyguard also, as a regiment, is based there. Uh, uh, how I got this assignment is, I think it's, it's a culmination, like I said, of you, if you keep doing certain kind of work and, you know, you put your work out, uh, it gets noticed by people in various positions who are then looking for photographers who will do the kind of work that they want done. Uh, so since I have, you know, been doing a fair mix of commercial and, uh, you know, personal work, which has to do with travel, which has to do with portraiture, uh, I was, you know, uh, asked by Sahapedia, uh, there's a person who was in charge of this particular project, you know what, uh, Sahapedia had been uh, actually commissioned for by the Rashtrapati Bhavan was to do six books on different aspects of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, and the Shaswani Chandra, she is a doctorate, uh, young lady, she was 30 years old at that time, she was my boss because she was looking after all these books. Uh, and it's a pleasure because she's so knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the entire thing. Uh, uh, so she liked my work and then, you know, they obviously showed it to people within the Rashtri Bhavan. And so it was decided that they'll commission me. Uh, there were six, like I said, six books. So PBG is one which I did. And there was uh, the art of uh, Rashtri Bhavan, the architecture which is done by Ram Rehman. Uh, the food and the kitchens of Rashtrapati Bhavan and, you know, the way dining is done because there was a certain style in that, uh, which is a thing being done by Dheeraj Paul, uh, you know, so pretty, you know, very good photographers were given different aspects of it. Uh, I was lucky to get the President's Bodyguard because this actually is, had to do with, you know, the entire pomp and grandeur of the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the ceremony and, the, you know, the the real flash, the way, you know, it's, it's all projected as, the, I would say, the, the face of the power of uh, the ruling class comes through with that. Uh, and uh, because one was commissioned, I ended up going to Rashtrapati Bhavan for a period of almost two years. So again, like Subodh, you pointed out very correctly, uh, you know, things don't work in a matter of weeks or days, you know, when you're working on a long project or when you're working in a book. Uh, because the idea here was that I wanted to photograph every aspect of not just the ceremonies in which they were involved, which were the formal ceremonies to do with the president and whatever the president's you know, role is in the politics of the country, but also the behind the scenes in terms of who are these men, you know, where do they come from, what kind of villages and towns they came from. I went to, you know, various villages and to the homes of uh, some of the men. Uh, how do they train? How are the horses trained? You know, uh, how do they practice? Uh, what else do they want to do? Uh, you know, for instance, as far as the young man who is joining the president's bodyguard, uh, he is joining the army. He's not joining to be an ornament of the president, you know, who, where he looked pretty standing with, you know, fancy clothes and this fancy, you know, under a fancy chandelier in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. He wants to serve his country. I mean, that's why he's there. So very, you know, intelligently and very sensitively, what has been worked out for them is that every couple of years, they are sent to either the Armored Corps to, you know, be part of the Armored Corps and, you know, learn about tanks, etc. Or they... They go to the paratroopers regiment in Agra and they learn paratrooping and, you know, are there uh, for about a year. And they're sent to Siachen uh, to be, you know, to serve on the glacier and they go there for about six months at a time. So, you know, in a way that through rotation, it's not just that they are being the president bodyguard, but through this service, they do other things which have to do with the army and which makes them feel like, look, I'm a soldier also. So I got the chance to also look at all those things and that came about really out of, you know, discussing this with the Yashaswani, with other people in Sarpedia and very importantly with the commandant of the president's bodyguard. Uh, so they have a very good overview of the, what all goes into being the president's bodyguard and its history and everything. So let me just show you a few pictures now. Uh, so like I said, you know, they, they go out training every morning, go out riding every morning at 5 a.m. 
uh, and this actually eventually turned out to be the cover picture. This picture is within the premises of uh, uh, the Rashtrapati It is, Bhavan. see, the Rashtrapati Bhavan is one large estate, which is about 400 acres. And just outside it is this forest, which is part of the green belt in Delhi. Uh, and that's one area which also has uh, a polo ground and there's a jungle around that. Okay. So every morning, the president's bodyguard rides to that, which is just you know, going through one road. And then they go into the polo ground, which is also some of them are very good polo players. Uh, they also do various things in terms of you know tricks on horseback, which I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. Uh, and the entire you know riding different kind of conditions for the horses and their exercise. So it's it's all part of that really. But as you can see, this beautiful this is a winter morning, uh, not yet you know Delhi is December January kind of winter. Uh, it was, I think, about November, so it's, it's a nice, you know, hazy morning, beautiful sunlight falling through the trees. Uh, they're not wearing winter clothes, as you can see, they're still in their, their summer uh, uniform. But, you know, the, the puggery, the black clothes, the horses, I mean, they're so beautiful. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure just hanging around with them, you know. As a photographer, of course, it was like a dream. So this is one of the you know major things which the president's bodyguard uh, is about. This is the when they give a guard uh, a guard of honor, I think it's called. I yeah. forget. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the terminology. Guard now. of honor, yeah, for the yeah. So, uh, so if you see, they're lined up in the center of the courtyard outside the Rashtrapati Bhavan, and uh, he's the commandant. Uh, and you know, once the all the men and everyone is in position and lined up. Then he will ride in from the side of the courtyard. Uh, and then he will make a call, and then the president and the president guests, etc., will come out. And the you know, the fancy car, etc., comes from the back there, and uh, uh, they go off to you know wherever they're supposed to go to parliament or to you know any other engagement. So this is on the left, this is the one of the you know, horseman with the trumpet, and that's the seal of the PBG, you know, which is, you know, which is embroidered on the flag of his trumpet. So as the commandant arrives there, then he will blow the trumpet, which is the signal for the Guard of Honor to be started. Uh, this now they are in their winter uniform, and uh, this is the practice for, you know, doing the uh, uh, Republic Day Parade. And so obviously I couldn't shoot if the parade was on because I wouldn't have been able to be in this kind of position. Uh, but because I was shooting this for the Rashtrapati Bhavan, you know, I had access to, I could actually tell this entire regiment to come up and down this hill about four times so that I could get the right shot. You know, so it's just a great sense of power you get, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I've got the shot, but I think I want to try it again. You know, so can you, can you imagine a hundred horses being turned around, going back and then coming back again? And I'm standing on top of a, what's called a five-tonner truck. So I have enough elevation to be able to get this kind of, you know, it's, just, it's, I'm down the hill. I would have been looking up at them, which would make for a very awkward shot. Uh, so I stood on top of this big truck, so I could be at eye level with them then. So, you know, you have to think, you have to pre-visualize, you have to, you know, have a concept of the kind of picture you want to take. Uh, that's how it becomes different and special, I think. This is the changing of the guard, which happens every weekend. Uh, you know, there's uh, one bunch of people who are at the various vantage points uh, through the week, and then another bunch comes on. So this is how the, the changing of the guard happens. So it's just, you know, it's again, if you, if you look, it's all about light. It's about, you know, anticipating the moment. It's about symmetry. It's about composition. You know, you have to be technically right. You have to be able to make sure that, you know, look, what is my aperture so that the, I get some of the background in focus, but not to be so sharp, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so all these things come into play. Uh, like I said, I used to hang around. Actually, I used to, uh, every other day I used to go there, even if there was nothing special happening there. 
So I, used, I wanted to just follow their life, their everyday life. So, you know, whether it was in the barracks, I'd be there and we'd, when they're dressing up. You know, I spent a lot of time in the stables where the horses are kept, where they're groomed, where they're fed, where they're bathed. And this is just a marvelous, you know, uh, experience. So what you realize, what I realize is that, you know, each of these men are six feet plus. I mean, that's the mandatory requirement for you to be, if you have to be in the president's bodyguard. So they're giants. And these horses also are lady, you know, large, big horses, and they're all brown in color. But the, you know, the relationship between the horses and the men over time is so gentle and because so caring that the men become like what I used to call them uh, gentle giants, you know, not just mm -hmm. soldiers, you know, it's, it's just a very different kind of, and they're, and they're really, you know, respectful, they're really caring, they're very sensitive, but yet they're strong men, you know, so just the way I think men ought to be, they don't have to be macho and they don't have to be stupidly, you know, masculine mm -hmm. all the time. That's all right. Yeah, so. You know, you can see, you know, that sense of caring, the sense of involvement, the sense of engagement. And like I said, you know, so this is the polo ground. Uh, so they also, you know, train to do other things. It's not just that you sit on the horse and you hold lance and stand behind the president, you know, uh, because for any army person, they would want other skills. They would want to excel in things. So. Some of them take up various kind of, you know, horse riding kind of tricks, or I'm sorry what the word is, but this is tent pegging, for instance, and they, you know, train for that, they compete nationally. And this is an Agra, this is the paratroopers uh, battalion. So they get to train as paratroopers, be there for about a year. Uh, I couldn't get, you know, permission to get onto one of these planes. There was some kind of emergency thing happening within the army at that time. Uh, but I did get to be on the base and photograph them there. And they spent six months on the glacier, you know, which is, as you know, is some 18,000 to 24,000 feet height. Uh, temperatures never going beyond minus 20 degrees you know with most of the year so the training itself is you know done for about two months before they can be physically fit enough to be able to go onto the glacier uh, so this is at the glacier the, the base camp which is also at a height of about 13 or 14 thousand feet so i was there for about a week photographing all the activities and i realized how out of shape i was you know <laughs> How in shape uh, they Siachen are. Sorry. Uh, is this Siachen base camp? This is the Siachen base camp, yes. yes. In yes. Ladakh. Also, I, you know, we, uh, Shashwini and I had looked at a lot of the, you know, earlier drawings and etchings and paintings and old photographs and the archival material, which is available in the Rashtrapati Bhavan of the you know, the 150 odd years of the president's bodyguard. Uh, and there used to be these formal portraits of the men done with their full uniform, etc. So I wanted to do that in one in that style, but be a bit more modern. Uh, I wanted to do them as studio uh, portraits, which is where my experience as a commercial photographer, for instance, comes in. So I've got these, you know, painted backdrops made. Uh, and uh, I've created a you know, nighttime studio uh, outdoors where we used to start shooting at 10 o'clock in the night, uh, waiting for it to be dark now because the studio had to be outdoors because we also had been doing portraits with, with horses and I couldn't have taken them into a studio or something. So this canvas backdrop, which is, you know, big enough to drop from the second floor of a building and into this very large open courtyard. Uh, so we used to start shooting at about 10 o'clock so that once, you know, it, it I could see the effect of my flashlights and there was no ambient light to, you know, in any way influence the lighting then. So we did a series, a short about four days of this, because they have different uniforms uh, for different times of different occasions and different seasons. So we photographed all of those. So all the light in this picture is from the flash. This is, this is, this could be a studio. The only thing is that, you know, because of the size, there are no walls, Okay. but it's, it's studio portraiture.
and this is the back cover. Uh, I love the fact of you know this gently going away into the light kind of a feeling which this photograph had. So that's uh, the story of the president's bodyguard. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Did you shoot the president? Oh yes, of course. Oh, yeah. okay. The president think, uh, uh, Pranab in his office. Sorry. At that time, who was the president uh, during this? Uh, Pranab Mukherjee. Yeah, yeah. Pranab Mukherjee. So, so I shooting. didn't. I didn't just shoot uh, Pranab Mukherjee in the office. I also photographed Barack Obama because he was a oh. guest of honor at okay. the Republic Day parade uh, in one of the in that particular year. Uh, and Prime Minister Modi, because there was this, you know, there's this evening thing which they have after Republic Day, where the guest of honor would be, in that case, was uh, President Obama. Okay. Mr. Modi was there, the president, you know, the entire cabinet, the opposition leaders. So I have all those photographs to which. So it was like I'm a portraiture shot, like individual shots of each? Uh, with the president, they are portraits in okay. three different kind of situations. Uh, with the others, they're candid photographs of parties or of, you know, uh, okay. it, it's. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful. Also, what happened then was, since I'd been shooting this, uh, there was a sixth title, which is called Life in Rashtrapati Bhavan. Mm. So, whereas this is about the pomp and pageantry of Rashtrapati Bhavan, because it has to do with the president bodyguard and all the you know fabulous events, uh, Life in Rashtrapati Bhavan is, thanks to this, they wanted to, you know, gave me that title to work on also. And that was about the fact that, yes, the president lives here, but this is a 400 acre estate in which it's almost like a small town, which all kinds of people live there. You know, people who, the barbers live there, the shopkeepers live there, you know, the, the people who make the saddles, the people who, you know, it's just, so I spent another year and a half photographing that then. That's another book altogether. I think it's in your uh, website, I guess. I did, I did yes, see the pictures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Very subtle way of looking at. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what was interesting was I got to, you know, see both sides of the, the ordinary everyday life and the, the fancy life of uh, did you get to stay in rashtrapati bhavan for a night uh, i had to uh, for instance the to be able to go and photograph the republic day parade because it's the security around uh, so to be able to get passes and you know explaining to six different you know blockades across the eleven gurgaon to come across would be a big pain so i did spend two days there Nice. And a couple of times, otherwise too, because you know, like I said, they would go out at five in the morning, uh, uh, you know, doing various things. Yeah, a couple of times I did stay, stay on, but I used to stay in the in the mess in the president's bodyguard mess, okay. which is a beautiful, you know, building itself. Okay. Uh, from moving to this uh, wonderful series to another series which I really like, uh, which I saw on your website, because I'm a, you know, uh, I stay in Dubai, but uh, all of my workshops mostly happen in India, and for the last four or five years I've been telling uh, you know, uh, people who follow me that uh, soon we'll have workshop somewhere else. We'll go to Thailand, we'll go to Myanmar, but I again end up going to India because India is such a country, <laughs> you can't help it. You know, it's just so... It's good. a continent. India is, I yeah. call India a continent which pretends to be a country. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite places in India, um, there are a couple of them and uh, one of them is Taj Mahal uh, because I always said Taj Mahal is overhyped, this and that, but the moment I saw it in real for the first time, as a photographer, I couldn't take a picture. I couldn't even think of mm -hmm. taking a picture because I was it's just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then I saw your pictures, you know, and uh, recently we were going to Holi, uh, Preeti and many of us here, uh, Ayush, they're all part of that trip. And we stopped in the Daba on the way <clears throat> to Vrindavan. Uh, in between, on the, what is that highway, Narmada Highway, Yamuna Highway? Yeah. Yamuna Highway. Yeah. So we stopped in a, a small little hotel kind of a thing and we saw a picture there on the wall of Taj Mahal and it was your picture. I don't know whether they took your permission or through Incredible India, the poster work. So I told this is taken by... Yeah, I remember that. You remember, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I told you it's taken by Dinesh Khanna. So it's such yeah. a beautiful picture. Uh, all those series of pictures of Taj Mahal. So we would love to go through that pictures and also know sure. how yeah. that happened. Yeah. Okay, I'll, let me just give you a little background to that, if I may. Uh, yeah. I don't mind my taking a few minutes to explain the background. No, I don't, no problem. Okay, so I call this... Uh, the only thing I'm going to show you in this section is the Taj uh, pictures. But there's a... In my head, there's something called stage street. You know, I... By heart, I'm a street photographer. Uh, it's a skill of mine, which is also known to other, you know, people I work with in the commercial field, uh, whether they are directors and clients, etc. 
And once in a while comes along, you know, campaigns which require a street photography approach. Uh, but because it's to be done for advertising, you have to stage it. So which is why I call it stage street. So the idea is to make it look like street, make it look like street photography, to make it look like candid. But you're obviously making so that everything which is in the frame is there because you staged it, uh, right? So I was approached by an ad agency called Trikaya Gray. Uh, this is about 15 years ago. And uh, the Incredible India campaign was being done really, you know, a big, uh, big campaign which is being organized by the Indian government to promote tourism to India. And uh, they had approached me to photograph the Taj for the Incredible India campaign because it was the 350th anniversary of the Taj. And the idea was to do 12 pictures so there could be a calendar. And also some of those photographs would then be used as part of the Incredible India campaign to make posters and to make press ads and what have you to be, and to be used all over the world. Uh, so in our discussions, I did say to them that, look, if you're looking at photographing the Taj as this beautiful marvel of architecture and this cold, you know, marble mausoleum of love, then I'm the wrong photographer because whereas I love doing architecture, but what I would want to do is to bring in the color of ordinary everyday India into these pictures. Because if you're looking at promoting India worldwide, then what is India's, you know, signature, India's signature is color. Uh, and so, you know, I explained to them the kind of pictures I had in mind. I said, look, if we can do those and we use the Taj as one of the elements in the picture rather than the overbearing, you know, this marvelous huge building, uh, which it is, which everyone knows. And so, you know, why do you want to repeat that again? Fortunately, they agreed. And we thought of 12 different situations of the way life is lived ordinarily in different parts of the country. And yes, we, we set it up because after all, we were there going there only for a week to shoot. So we organized, you know, the various elements in which I'll just tell you and the props, etc. So here goes. So this was the campaign. This is the picture you would have seen, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so the cameras were brought from Jaipur because there are no cameras in Agra. So they actually had traveled 200 kilometers to get to Agra so that we could shoot. We, with my stylist, my production team, and it was the largest team we were working with, you know, we'd made sure we'd bought the turbans and we bought the fabric to, you know, and all the ornaments for the camels, etc. Uh, this particular picture, I can guarantee, is the most used photograph ever taken by an Indian photographer. And the joke in my family is that if I had even taken 10 rupees each time it was used, <laughs> then I would be a karodpati, you know. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Absolutely. And the reason, with that. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the Ministry of Tourism rightly, you know, I, I worked on an assignment basis with it. So I, I got my assignment piece and that was it. But all these photographs were given by the Ministry of Tourism unlicensed. And this was their uh, understanding with the agency to travel agents, to travel operators, to Indian embassies, to anyone and any magazine, whoever wanted to, you know, because the Incredible India campaign was being run you know, in a large way at that time. And this was the one picture which is used the most of the entire lot. So uh, here is a, here's a missed opportunity for my having been a Karodpati and <laughs> not being just one middle class photographer. <laughs> Sorry, you, uh, someone was going to yeah. ask. Yeah. So Shamim here. There, sir, this is unbelievable picture. The colors, the pink, blue, I mean, it's vibrant. And it's like perfectly vibrant, not over vibrant, not under, like perfectly the Indian vibrancy is there. Can you talk about the colors? How did you achieve this color, the blue, and what was the concept behind the colors? Okay. Glad you asked me that question because there are two things which I want to make, I was going to be talking about, but I'll uh, stop at this picture only and tell you about. Uh, this campaign was shot at a time when digital was just about happening. We had been working with digital only about a year and I, not just me, all of us photographers at that time, were not yet fully confident of the quality of digital in terms of output. And especially since we knew that, you know, these photographs can be used in large posters and large hoardings and a big calendar. Uh, so it, the resolution required would be, you know, impeccable. And that time, if I remember the camera was, was it an eight megapixel or something, mm -hmm. uh, or 10 or something like that, but not you know much more than that. 
these are the initial uh, first, first or second of, generations yeah 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 so i have shot this campaign in 120 film and in digital all right and the photographs which were finally used at that time were from the 120 transparency because the quality of those were the colors were just beautiful all right these are the original transparency colors nothing's been done to that except the color of the water yeah water yeah exactly. it is totally un you know unreal for the water yes, true color of the of a river and especially a river in flood which is what is if you can see with the amount of water here for it to be anything other than brown but in the ministry of tourism they had decided that tourism pictures where water is shown or water body is shown the water is blue so that is only the way it is inviting for tourists so we had major arguments with them ki, you know how can you do that you know water is this is a river this is not the ocean this is not you know maldives or this is not mauritius you know this is not bali people would expect it but they said no this is a very big campaign we are showing the river and so therefore the water has to be blue so that is the only thing which is done at that time in what was called the system you know there was no lightroom or photoshop or whatever system was this mysterious machine which processors and printers used to have to which your transparency was sent and you know you would mark off what neat changes you wanted to do and it used to take four or five days to make those changes and then you know whatever file or whatever used to come back and that's what this is so everything else is exactly as per what was shot on a 120 transparency film the water color has been changed so let me just show uh, you the other picture also one more question if i may mm -hmm. yeah so uh, i'm just trying to understand so before shooting something like this do you have a storyboard or a sketchboard okay i want to taj the background like this the camel walking how do you come up with the concept okay so like i said we had 12 photographs to do Uh, each of them very specifically we had figured out what kind of situation or what kind of people or what kind of crowd you have which you'll understand as i show you the pictures uh, should i show you the pictures so that it's yeah, easier yeah yeah yeah, yeah. of course yeah yeah, yeah. yes yeah perfect you know so the idea and like i was saying was i wanted to take the everyday life of india and have the taj as a part of it or as a backdrop to it So as you can see, we've shot from the other side of the river. Uh, we've not shot from in front of the Taj, so that we can have the river in it. So whatever life happens on the banks of the river or on the river, with the Taj as a backdrop, is the is the concept for this declared uh, campaign. And you know, anywhere you go in India on the river, you'll see boatmen. You go to Banaras. You go to you know the Hooghly in Calcutta, whatever. and normally they dress up their boats with you know some kind of colored fabric etc so yes there is also an element of exaggeration here because after all this is an advertising picture and which is why i called it stage street is not street the way you find it but the exaggeration is from the reality of a situation like this uh you know camels are decked up by people who you know own camels uh it's not unusual for them to be decked up boats are decked up with color uh okay now so that is one part we had gone for a recce in the month of i think june or something and in june it was peak of summer and the river is almost like one little nala of water right so the entire area was empty and there was one trickle of water which is running through because this is you know 45 degrees temperature etc so anyway then by the time we and we decided ki, okay we'll shoot this one here and we shoot that situation there and etc etc uh we came back to shoot in the month of september october and what we hadn't realized which is you know what happens uh, if you don't do your homework fully which you can't yeah. at all time is that by then the monsoons had happened and also the snow melt had happened so the river was now in flood water level has come up so the water levels had gone up which is you know this is it wasn't intended for camels to be walking through water we didn't have a choice i am standing in water because the river is from edge to edge from where i am standing behind me is a very high embankment and i would be you know almost at the level of these the camel owners if i was to stand up then shoot so i stood in the water and shot this 
and you don't expect camels to walk through water. I mean, they're not. They're, they're, they're the ship of the desert. They're not the ship of the ocean. But we were there. We had to shoot. And it, this is the reason why people thought this was a very unusual shot. So what was an accident actually became the strength of this picture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is what I mean by serendipity. And that's what I mean by luck. You know, just at times things that you don't plan for just fall into place and make something, you know, unusual because it is unusual then. Because it's not fact, limited by your own thinking. In fact, anyway, when I saw this first, I thought this is too good to be true. Maybe it's a Photoshop because first of all, like you said, desert and water and color. Like this is too good to be true. It's like amazing. It's like uh, we thought we were we were we thought we are sunk. We thought we are we made all <laughs> these big arrangements, spent so much money, big team of twenty people have come here. What are we gonna tell the client that we are idiots? We didn't know that the water will be, you know, this river will be in flood. So we couldn't even go back and tell them, sorry, you know, because the campaign had to be released. It was the 350th anniversary of the Taj, etc. But because of this accident, it, everyone loved it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, I didn't say that we planned it, but well, <laughs> we never said that we were idiots. <laughs> All right, so let me just run through. So, you know, it's, it's just now these are things which I've seen around India because I've traveled so much, you know, all over the place. You see women drying saris on the, you know, whether it's the riverbanks, on the streets, on the ghats. You know, this is how it's done. Even within Agra, there is that bridge below which there's a lot of saris. Yeah, which are it's, it's, yeah. Uh, Very much India. You, yeah. you know, you go around 15th August, if you come to the north of India, or if you go in Makkah Sankranti time, you go towards Gujarat, etc. Yeah, yeah. You find people flying kites and, you know, kids running around and, but here also, if you see, you know, just to get the colors right, of course, one, like I said, we were shooting in September, October, which is not the kite flying season. So we bought, you know, a few hundred kites from the wholesale market in Sadar Bazaar and taken with us. And we bought these clothes for these guys. The boys are from that area only. They lived in the villages around and all day used to be playing around there. But because we, I wanted to look colorful, so, you know, because so we bought these t-shirts and these shorts for them and gave them the... You know, all these were bought from the market and we set up this stand and got this girl to... Complete creative yeah, freedom. Yeah. Mehndi was, uh, you know, actually, we got the Mehndi wala, got this Mehndi done. So, you know, like a thing like this was done two days before this shot was to be done because you have to wait for the Mehndi to you know, get that strong color. And here the water is? Sorry? And here the, the reflection is? Reflection is, is as serious. I mean, it's not created. The water was like this. The color is unreal. Sh Shamim is a big time Photoshop guy. So he's really trying to get something out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like I said, this is before Photoshop and Lightroom. Okay. So yeah. it's not like we had, you know, as individual, we could, you must look this up in Google or whatever. It was called the system. I don't even know what the technical word. It was this mysterious system which the printing presses or the processing houses had, hmm. where your transparency was sent, and then they had to take. It used to take a few days to make those changes. So as you can see, each of these things is thought of. It is from everyday Indian life, you know. Ghadas are made, painted. Uh, yes, of course, you don't find uh, water sitting on the side of the river, you know, of the Taj. But anywhere in India, you do find that. So there's an unreal, unreal rea reality in all these pictures. And when Taj is there, you don't have to even explain where the place is. You know, when Taj yeah. is there, it's India. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So it really helps. And the point was Shubodh was making it that the, the Taj is such an imposing structure that I didn't want it to impose on India. You know, yeah. I want it to be part of India. Yeah. You know, which is why these photographs have been shot like this. Thank you. This brand, yeah. Sorry, just take one second. No, no, no. Thank you. So both please let me know if I'm running over time. We've just about started. No, no, we are all good. We are all good. <laughs> so 
all these people, all these garments, you know, all these pagadis, this is part of the production, which took us a couple of weeks to organize. And this was a shoot which is done over a period of about 10 days, I think. Uh, Beautiful. All right, so that was the... Uh, have I answered your questions or did you have any more about this? Perfect. <laughs> Just love the color. Everything is too good. <laughs> it makes us feel very... Uh, Jealous, actually. Yeah. Yes, so as you can see, like for instance, dream, dream shots. All these things are like when we when we visit Taj, like we can't. This all day in the mind, but nowhere close we can go for these things. But you know, like the point I was making about uh, this being, uh, you know, like in this case, if you see the sky is not so blue, it's just become you know partly cloudy. I shot this. This is a shot done in the evening, which you can make out from the shadows which are falling from left to right. If you look at the yeah. corner on the left, right. Uh, because the sun rises on this side, this is east, and it travels this way. Uh, so if you look at the shadows in the Taj also. So it was late evening, it was, so it, it was fine. I mean, it's not that we wanted it to be, you know, like even here, it's again, it's, an, it's a late afternoon shot. You can see the shadows of the rickshaws falling uh, towards the left. Uh, but this is the morning shot. Uh, and so there's a bit of a mist effect off the river because early in the morning there will be it will be slightly misty off the river. You know, and this Which is. Which year was the dance of this campaign? Which year was this year? Uh, I would think about 2006 or something like that. Okay. Okay. So what should we yeah. carry on? Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yes. So uh, there is uh, another uh, series which I came across on your uh, website as I was running through. And uh, I remember asking you as soon as I saw that project, I took some screenshots and sent you asking whether this is Russia or somewhere in one of those <laughs> countries or it's uh, where is this? And you told it's very much India. So it really surprised me because the kind of uh, glitter and glamour in those pictures yeah, yeah. and some weird painting in the background with a guy in a swimming suit. I'm, I'm like, this can't be India. Yeah. So it really was very interesting. It was too rich. To, uh, I even asked you whether these are real homes or these are just like a set built up to show to someone. And I was really surprised that these were mostly homes, real homes, people's homes. So I would love to see all those pictures and uh, get some stories uh, behind those images. Okay, part of my commercial uh, work is that I shoot, a, I shoot a lot for hospitality. Uh, so hospitality normally means shooting interiors of hotels, etc. And also food. And also people in you know, service situations and or enjoyment situations. Uh, so, because of the kind of architecture or interiors work I've been doing for hospitality, uh, at times I also get called in by interior designers or architects to shoot their work. Uh, so there's this a marvelous interior designer, a person called Adil Ahmed. Uh, he is based in Lucknow and Delhi, and uh, he's got the most extravagant and most over the top kind of sense of color and form and you know and uh, because he's an interior designer he, one place which he used to work on regularly and change you know quite frequently was his own home and uh, I photographed his home about four times in the last about eight to ten years every time he would change he would change it dramatically and he would ask me to shoot it for him and I would I would love doing it because it was just so quirky Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm the pictures you saw in which I'm going to show you. I, I I'm sorry I couldn't find the earlier folders. Uh, it would be interesting to actually see almost his journey as an interior designer across you know those years. But these are pictures I shot actually just about uh, two and a half months ago. Okay. Uh, this is where his house is right now. Uh, and he wanted me to shoot this because he was now selling this place and he's moving almost entirely to Lucknow to you know uh, be there. And this place uh, is in uh, Delhi or? Uh? It's in Delhi. It's in a place called Scenic Farms. If you know the area, it's okay. uh, in Delhi. Uh, it's a large es estate. Uh, uh, but what I love about it is that he's so flamboyant and he's so unapologetic of yeah, his yeah. sense mm -hmm. of color and form. And when he's shooting there, you know, when you go into his house, you wonder, Ki, where am I going to walk? Forget about where am I going to put my camera, you know. <laughs> so that's the challenge, which is what I find really interesting, you know, as a photographer. You know, that how do I put myself in his head and see what he sees? Yeah. Uh, so here are a few pictures of. I mean, if you see, there's not an inch which is left unadorned, you know, it's just 
where there's the ceiling, the ceiling's gold, you know, look at the lights, look at the chandeliers, mirrors, the, you know, and different textures on the walls. The, the center table is full of stuff. You know, where would you put that drink of yours, you know, if you were to go there? It's, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's for beautiful. a photographer, I thought it was a dream place to shoot. And it's, it's very, you know, it's just there are mirrors all over the place, you know, the reflective surfaces, there's metal. So it's actually very tough, you know, in terms of how to light it, you know, how to balance your lights, make sure that lights don't show in the mirrors. And I must say that, yeah, there would be a couple of situations where you know that there's a reflection and then you, you know, get your Photoshop chap to take it out for you. So you're trying, to mix, the, you're trying to mix natural light with the flash here. Uh, flash, natural light and, and also the ceiling lights. <laughs> and also the tension, yeah. yeah. So a lot of white balance uh, to manage. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you also want to make it look natural at the end of it, you know. You know that there are different color temperatures operating, uh, but you don't want it to look freaky. So here is the in indoors tungsten, the outdoor sunlight, you know, it's... it's uh, and these are all uh, single images, right? You don't uh, blend images with the no, parts by single, parts. Single images. Single. They're not HDR, they're nothing. It's a single images. A lot of control, amazing control. That's the, I, I, I would say that that's the training from film. Yeah. One you know, it, it makes you I... stop and look and, you know, you assess the situation you're going to be photographing. I think if you lose your memory card in this home, you'll never find it again. <laughs> it just camouflages there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You might not find your camera, forget about a memory card. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the bedrooms are another theme altogether is loud colors and, you know, it's just, I don't know what it's to live there, but it's just a dream to photograph. <laughs> and what he's done is, is, is you know, the more, uh, most unexpected things, you know, and it's not like it's always very expensive stuff or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's and a lot of frames, a lot of pictures from because it's a, it's an old Khandani family from Lucknow. I mean, they go back many generations. Look at these mirrors. You know, the mirrors are obviously you know a couple of hundred years old. It's uh, it's really charming. That's the outdoor. There's a gazebo outside. <laughs> so then you know a, a place like this, you have to shoot at a particular time. You only get that ten minute window. You know when the sunlight is just right. And when it's not too dark yet, you know, so you have to balance everything properly. Okay, so, yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, thanks for sharing that. There are many more <coughs> images uh, which you can uh, watch uh, on uh, Dinesh sir's uh, website uh, from the series of homes. Uh, you will see many, many, many more of uh, such images. As he told, he has been shooting the whole process for many years. Uh, so coming to the next part, uh, again, uh, something I saw it on your uh, website, as well as I follow you on Instagram and Facebook, I always see that you have this eye for simplicity for the day to day life, you know, uh, still life and all those little things. Because we as photographers, when we go out and shoot, we're always looking for that great image, you know, this great image or that perfect image. We are always looking at the bigger picture and we tend to kind of ignore what's in front of us. There's so much of color, there's so much of light talking to each other and there's a conversation with, of them with the still life around on the streets, which we may kind of ignore. But I see that you have a whole series about this uh, uh, still life on, uh, on the streets, be it doors or be it walls or be it windows. You try to exploit uh, the opportunities in those little things and you have made a whole series of images, which I would like you to speak about next because... This is something that we all as photographers need to do more than just see the bigger picture. When you see Taj, also think of more than just the Taj. Look at the smaller details, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, you're right. It is the, I use a very bland kind of uh, title for this particular section on my website. It's called Doors, Windows and Walls. Uh, but for me, it's actually more about feeling and like I said, you know, engaging with certain things. So it's, I'm engaging with these and because I photograph old buildings uh, and elements of old buildings because to me, old buildings are history. 
old buildings are heritage old buildings is another time old old buildings is another way of life and i'm very conscious of the fact that as old buildings become old and become neglected and become derelict and then are broken down that the stories and a way of life also then gets lost along with them so that's why i call this old buildings house old stories and if you lose old buildings you lose these stories uh, so as much as you know our grandparents and great grandparents also died and went away we don't really remember what the lives were uh, similarly these buildings in which they lived you know also break down and go away so I, so that's where i'm coming from so and within the old buildings to me somehow the windows and the doors look like the facial features of a house i'm looking at i'm looking at the face of a building the windows are the eyes the doors are the mouth uh, so they speak to me i reach out to them they reach out to me uh, so here we go and all the cracks on the house maybe the wrinkles of age <laughs> yeah that's the wrinkles of the face that's the aging that's you know so like so what what you were saying i uh, just wanted to expand on that because you know being on the street should not only be about the smart moment or that you know being the hunter for the right you have to also look into your own heart you know you also have to look into your own mind what is it that is engaging you what is it that you are loving you know what is it that you want to take away other than just the thrill of taking a picture uh it's that's to my mind is the difference between a camera owner and a photographer so it's you know either straight photographs which is where you know the story is within the door and the painting around you know they it's, so this is not just it's not just the color of a door it's not just the antiquity of a door you looking at a culture you looking at a way of life which actually is almost dying out because as you travel now and as you travel over the next 10 years you'll find that you don't find these anymore because people don't have the time or people are moving into apartments and condominiums and what have you and this way of life is going to die out with the way of architecture you know like these archways and these the setback for instance this is this is to do with the wisdom of architecture you know that india is a hot country so this setback where your front door is inside from and it was sheltered by the archway and by the porch is so that there is a gap between the hot sun and the interior of a house you know there's a lot of thought over the years which has got accumulated and turned into this and which we are just losing because we want to adopt something else you know look at look at the detailing look at the look at the aesthetic look at the look at the kind of work which you see on those balconies up there it's it's i can spend hours just sitting there and, you know wondering my god you know so what was the discussion which this house owner was having with his you know designer and the our crafts people who are going to make this can you imagine what kind of engagement that would be you know how to it's a, here we'll have this jali there we'll have the raj and how did they make these homes you know this is i i can you know transport myself back sit in front of a house like this for an hour not even take a picture and you know look back it's almost like looking at a time capsule you know i can almost imagine the kind of people they were you know who would be sitting out there in the evenings and talking to each other and smoking a hookah and what have you on the other hand you know look at the simplicity of this this is a staircase these are just stone slabs which are embedded into a wall uh, and going from the ground floor and the, the only way you can make out that they are stairs if you look carefully is because of the angle of the sunlight you know the shadow as it's going across and then you know the photographs which is not just about color and form and texture it's also the human human element then you know like get a bit of the sari in here which is almost alien to the blue and the green which is happening on the wall the red is uh, you know it startles you when you see it you know this is something which really gives you a thrill as a photographer to find a yellow wall and then find a woman suddenly appearing from someone somewhere and she's wearing a yellow sari 
you know, or a yellow wall in Tamil Nadu and a yellow scooter standing in front of it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a game you play with yourself also. It's, it's, you know, not every picture has to be heavy with meaning, you know. Even just the fact that there's a thrill in finding a juxtaposition of color or form, uh, to my mind, that is what is the pleasure of being a street, uh, street photographer. You know, or, or the, at least in India, there's, there's the animals who are on the street and you find them sitting against walls or buildings. You know, this is the photograph which is there in my the, the exhibition I was telling you about, which is my first solo in 96. And everyone just loved this picture. It's the prints which have been sold of this in you know fair number. Uh, because this sheer sparseness of this, you know, is, is something which people are not used to in a photograph. You know, you normally find photographs which are full of action and everything. I shoot those too, but I always also love the, you know, that just that one thing, one element, you know, talking to just one other element, and that's it. You know, like this flower shop in Goa, it, it was just being set up, so they just started putting out the flowers and it was about 6.37 in the morning. You know, like here, this is now obviously a traditional house, a home which is probably 100 years old, but there's already elements of a modern world which is crept in, you know, that plastic bottle, the Pepsi fridge on the side, you know, the electric wire, the tube light, but look at those pillars, you know, look at the, the gods, you know, look at the colors. So it's this, you know, it's this almost like looking at a time capsule. You're looking at the, uh, you know, time continuation virtually over a period of 100 odd years in just this one frame. You know, the Rangoli uh, on the ground. South India, I guess so. It is, yes. If you yeah. see the Rangoli on the ground and also the architecture is very typically. And if you look just above the Pepsi, yeah, uh, that godhead is definitely South Indian. It's, yes. uh, it's very uh, Andhra, I think, somewhere. Yeah, it is. It's, it's probably is somewhere in, in Andhra Pradesh. Yeah. <clears throat> this actually is a picture which became very famous. It was a poster of my exhibition in '96, and uh, like that Taj picture with the camel. This is a photograph which also has been oft used in magazines. It's been the cover of three books. And I told the writer, I said, listen, but this has already been used. Said, but I love this picture. I want it in my book. I said, well, <laughs> go ahead. It's also, kursi ka. It's also <laughs> my fixation with kursis goes back to the early 90s. You, know? <laughs> you should stand for election someday. Huh? You should stand for election someday because that's the greatest uh, kissa kursi, ka, right? Uh, my symbol will be the kursi and I'll win. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a kursi. Yeah, I get the good see. <laughs> so that's the you know thing sure. about looking at the street and not just you know all the activity and stuff. Slow down, just watch what's happening. Go into areas which you normally would not expect to go into. You know, it's it's actually everything is interesting. You know, it's just a question of so what is it that speaks to you the most? You know, just be have have your heart open out to whatever's around you. And if you take photographs of things which talk to you, then your photographs would be that much richer in communication. Especially today with digital, there's nothing to lose. At the end, you just yeah, have to absolutely. archive it. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. one day when you look back, you'll find a whole series of pictures. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you for sharing that. And uh, to move on, um, we uh, I saw your uh, work with C and A Foundation. I don't know the full form of C and A. I'm sure you'll expand on that. Uh, who? Mm -hmm. Who cover the or uh, I mean foundation who do uh, work with the organic cultivation of cotton uh, in India, right. China and Tanzania and on your website I saw the pictures from India and Tanzania put together it's the same cause same organization doing the same thing in two different countries and the contrast between Tanzania and India is very evident you know this uh, two different corners of the world but it's the same thing both of them are doing and you as a photographer are covering both of the journeys doing the same cultivation of organic cotton. So can you just uh, take us through this and also let us know the similarity between the countries and the people at the same time, maybe there's some difference also. Sure. Yeah. Because at the end, I think both of them are farmers. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, CNA is, uh, is a very well known fashion brand. Actually, uh, it's a European brand. Uh, and they 
almost the entire range of garments is made of cotton. So as an organization, therefore, there is a commitment to cotton, which has been there for a long time. And obviously, you know, they've made, built their business on cotton and made the money on cotton. But uh, being a sensitive organization, they also realized a few years ago that uh, cotton is actually one of the largest polluters uh, as far as agriculture is concerned. Because cotton, uh, both in terms of use of fertilizer and pesticides, is very heavy. And also there's been a fair amount of, you know, if you heard about the BT cotton and all that stuff. So there's a lot of, you know, controversy about uh, seeds and what have you. So in their, you know, attempt or desire to start correcting things uh, in terms of the pollution which cotton causes, uh, they set up a foundation, which is what is called the CNA Foundation, and started promoting organic cotton cultivation in areas where cotton is the main crop. So uh, this is in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra in India and also these two districts in Tanzania. And I also twice went to China because they started working in China, but then uh, that really hasn't taken off yet. Uh, so in India, there's a area called, there's a tribal area in Madhya Pradesh uh, called Sindhwa and Jabua, uh, which I was, you know, when I was asked to do this assignment, which is about four years ago, uh, the idea was that, you know, I would go there and I would spend about three, four days and I would photograph the activities of the, uh, you know, uh, CNA itself doesn't work in the field. They work with the local organizations and NGOs who have people who are, you know, from the area, who know the language, know the lifestyle, you know, so they're able to communicate better with the, with the farmers. Uh, so the idea is to go and, you know, do a documentary uh, coverage of sorts, or spend three, four days and go to two different areas and photograph whatever the activities were. So I did that and I came back with the pictures, which, uh, you know, the team here, and there was a person from Geneva, they all looked at the picture and they liked them very much. And then we, uh, so they asked, obviously we were discussing about what I felt about it and what ideas I had. So then I suggested to them, you know, that why don't we look at, if you want, uh, look at six farmers from each area and follow their life for the next three, four years uh, through seasons, through harvest, through cultivation, etc., and see how the life is changing, if at all. And they found the idea really interesting. So which was why, what was the four day assignment has actually now turned into a four year assignment. I've already been doing this for four years. Uh, so it was to start with India, one district of Sendwa, which I was shooting in. But thereafter it became Sendwa, became Jabua. It's also now I've gone and shot in Chindwara in Maharashtra. And then I went to China and now I've been going to Tanzania. I've already been there four times. Uh, so the idea is to look at how the farmer is engaging with cotton and the organic thing. And it's not just about organic uh, cotton because cotton is only, you know, a six month crop. So what do they do at other times? Are they becoming organic with other, and which is what's happening with a lot of the farmers. They, you know, other uh, crops is they're doing, they're also using organic means, etc. So anyway, so that is what it is. The photographs I want to show you now are more to do with the women in the, uh, cultivation process or in the village life so that's one of the things which I learned uh, much to my surprise in the beginning is that you know one has always thought of farming as being a male activity uh, but once I was there and I spent time in these areas I realized that it's the women who seem to do 60 70 percent of the work uh, whether it's in the fields and obviously in the homes whether it's about children whether it's in the marketplace but there's also other small businesses which you know they keep getting into and then there are also these cooperatives which women have formed, you know, which, so let me show you these pictures here. So I'm going to show you a few photographs of uh, the life of women in rural India in relation with this uh, project and also in Tanzania. You know, it's just quite literally backbreaking work. It's it's a lot of bending down. It's a lot of, you know, 
hundreds of acres of land which are covered it's uh, it, the weather is you know always either too hot or too wet i think that's why they're so strong <laughs> yep maybe coronavirus is confused because of that in rural places <laughs> and you know i didn't realize that you know women also we always think that you know when it comes to the animals when it comes to the bulls and the you know it's it's only the men it's also the women who get involved you know you know it's just i'm not staging any of this i'm shooting like documentary photographer like a photojournalist almost uh, i just go there spend the entire day from early in the morning till late in the evening and i spend days just you know being with them they know me you know i become invisible in a way you know they're not conscious of my camera and me uh, so that's the only way you can you know if you're doing documentary work that you can actually get photographs which are genuine and which are real is when you know your uh, your characters or your protagonist or the story which you're shooting is not aware of your you know is not conscious of your presence this is what i meant you know that in, uh, in whether it's some part of the the land holding or whether it's in different seasons you know it's just like they grow the marigold uh, in the months before festival time because there's a huge demand for uh, you know marigold in festivals and in for religious activities you know normally a village home is one large living space at the most two living spaces and the kitchen and the bedroom and this place for the animals you know it's all in one space and here you can see you know that the lady is uh, you know it's uh, heating peanuts but what's being used is fuel are corn cobs so the corn has been used this corn uh, kernels have been taken but the corn cob is being used as the fuel to fire it nothing goes for waste nothing food. goes to waste yes absolutely so whether it's a corn cob in the season when that's available or whether it's the you know the the cow dung which is used as a fuel and of course now with mr modi's you know entire and which has been extremely successful a lot of uh, kitchens now in rural areas have gas stoves the interesting thing is that because gas stoves i mean the gas cylinders very expensive that that is not used on a daily basis is probably used more for you know on special occasion kind of situations so there is a mix today of the traditional fuels and of the gas cylinder you know that women get together to grind their own grains and it becomes a social event and they sing a song and you know and they hang around for a few hours together So just a few minutes before a really major storm came and hit and everything just blew away and there was pelting rain for a couple of hours traditional silver jewelry tattoos it's it's i need to get one tattoo from them some day hmm i need to get one tattoo from them some day yeah you should get one of those yeah. traditional tattoos done you know <laughs> and this is very interesting you know so the the main thing about the organic uh, farming is the fact that all inputs are organic so whether it's your pesticides or whether it's your fertilizers they made from leaves etc which are you know uh, indigenous to that area uh, so what's being done here is that in this pot there it's a five leaf mix has been made uh, which is mixed with cow dung and jaggery and cow urine and then it will be sealed the spot will be sealed and kept to ferment for about a month and this is the traditional part what these women are doing all the women have reached out and put their hands on this pot to bless this particular concoction though we city city guys make fun of all these things 
when mm. you go deep there will be always be a tremendous significance between each one of the things there's there's you. there's wisdom in these things you know it's it's uh, i find it very funny that we make fun of what is actual wisdom you know i can understand you say that you know what an idiot he thinks if he drinks cow urine that he'll you know <laughs> get rid of covid 19 you know that's ridiculous for anyone to claim that uh, but at the same time to think that cow urine is not thought to be important or not be beneficial in other ways is also very stupid na no? you don't know thousands and of years of wisdom and and you know these these concoctions one of course is the, the research has been done by ngos like you know uh, who who have done it scientifically but they've looked at old practices of agriculture like you know what this farmer who told me in china he said look this is actually what you people are telling us what the ngos are telling us is the way farming used to be done by a great grandfather so you bringing that back and that is what used to work and what we done really is that we went ahead and poisoned our earth we poisoned our atmosphere we poisoned our food uh, by going this chemical route which is unnatural and we probably paying for that today yeah it's beautiful and a few photographs from tanzania so there's, there's you know there's there's a similarity because the land is similar the cotton plants are similar but the people are so different you know and which is what i love about the human race that there's so much diversity you know this there's, there's so many in a country like india you go 100 kilometers you find a new language and you go 200 kilometers you find a different food and cuisine all together you know it's, it's way of life is different i mean why wouldn't you want it to be different why would you want everyone to be the same how utterly ridiculous would the world be then <laughs> that's true this young woman she just she just 21 huh and she uh, has her own plot of land uh, about an acre in which she is growing organic cotton and then she has strangely now she has three kids she's not married okay uh, and so she does all the housework herself and there's no stigma to that in tanzania at least in the rural areas i was in you know so she liked the man and so she said okay i'm going to have a child with you and she had those are the three kids mm-hmm. and again if you look in you know, similarity in the kind of houses in though in tanzania I found that the homes were a bit more in the, in the sense that there were two three spaces even if the floor area might have been similar uh but the use of traditional fuels and that's something which is really interesting which is happening with women both in Tanzania and in India is that there are these cooperatives which have been formed uh, thanks to all these ngos where the women you know come together exchange ideas uh, they have a kind of a kitty where they all contribute money so that if anyone is in trouble they can borrow money for a month two months six months whatever is required and instead of going to a bank or going to money lender and paying exorbitant rates of interest did, did this uh, transform into a book this uh, series uh, it is intended to be it's kind of got a bit uh, you know on the pause mode at the moment and now i don't know when we'll start again depending on how the situation to do with travel etc is uh, but, but yeah, they've do, they've done a couple of exhibitions with this work uh, what they do is since cna operates around the world so they've used pictures and stories which are used in conferences i used in the brochures you know i used across geographies for instance uh, so the indian stories would be used in south america and you know the tanzanian story would be used in india i i been called to be, give presentations about my experience with the farmers and you know uh, so it's, it's it's been very enriching that way it's it's, uh, it's something which i never thought would be part of my life but it's become so like i said i'm i'm a commercial photographer i shoot you know pretty hotels and lovely food and all that but fortunately i've had this other bug which is that i love travel i love the street i love the ordinary life and that is what has you know probably got me work like this and which is where you know 
uh, I find it extremely enriching. So that also in turn has now led to other work to do with CSR activities of corporates, uh, which again would be a corporate whose product I'd been shooting on one, like Usha is one of my old clients. I've been shooting fans and appliances, you know, and heaters and stuff for them for the last 22 odd years now, right? But as Usha got into this CSR activity of setting up sewing schools around the country, so they asked me because they'd seen some of my work. I think uh, that is the next uh, part of this. Uh, so, I, uh, so I'm kind of giving yeah. a preamble to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's wonderful how it all works out, you know, like the. Yeah, so that, that's, uh, you know, you've, you've done a good job of it. It's, they are these, you know, on their own look like separate strands, look like separate threads, but that's what makes the tapestry of your life eventually, you know. It looks wonderful in book because each fold can take both the countries. Every yeah. time you turn a page, you see a similarity in both the countries. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, there's, there's one big difference between Tanzania and India. You know, the, the social thing between men and women is a lot more open, a lot huh. more frank. In India, you'll never, you, there's no way you'll, and this is a ginning bill in Tanzania, uh, where, you know, women work equally with men. It's, it's, uh, okay, so, yeah. Uh, as you just mentioned uh, in this uh, part uh, about uh, the Usha, Usha Silai School, uh, which is something I saw on your uh, website. And I always feel that rural women are the rock stars of a country. And uh, that particular series definitely looked like women empowerment done right. So uh, I would love to see the series uh, from yeah. Usha. Yeah. So it's, it's like a saying that, you know, Usha uh, is a very large company in India, which makes appliances. The main uh, product is fans of all kinds. But they also make home appliances like irons and heaters and toasters and what have you. And uh, they've been... You know, a very major client of mine for the last 22 odd years. Uh, and I very proudly say that, look, I, they are that one client, the only client who, if they call me up and say, we've got this one fan to shoot, I'll say, sure, send it over, I'll shoot it to you. You know, and I don't say, oh, but my day rate and my this date, you know, no, none of that. Uh, so it's, it's very important for you to understand, uh, this is my, uh, you know, way of looking at it, that, you know, we, we tend to get arrogant as photographers that, you know, I am the creator, you know, I am the creative person, you know, I am the one who has the vision. Uh, but just remember one thing when it comes to commercial photography that you are being called because, yes, someone has recognized your talent, respects what you do, all right? But remember that where your picture ends, their work starts. Because that photograph is not just for your personal satisfaction. That photograph is going to be used to probably sell crores worth of or millions worth of products and services. So that is the kind of faith they're placing in you. Be grateful for that. I mean, that is something I tell young photographers, you know, when I do my workshops, I do my classes, is that, you know, never ever have such a large head that you think that you're doing anyone a favor because you're doing an assignment for them. Understand that, yes, you've been called in because you've got the talent, because you have the style or because they have the confidence in you to produce the kind of work they want. But that work is not a piece of art which is going to be hung on someone's wall. It's going to go into an ad or it's going to go into a brochure or it's going to go into a website where millions of rupees will be generated for hundreds and thousands of employees of that company, which is meant for you know servicing the needs of their customers. It's that you're only one part of that big chain, you know, so don't get all fancy about, you know, oh, I am this creative person. Yes, it is your, you have to provide that service. You've been called in and you've been told that you will be given that thousand rupees or whatever it is that because the person has a faith in you to produce that picture, but that's not the end of the picture. The picture is meant for something else and not just for your ego. So in commercial photography, that is a very important lesson to be learned that don't think that people are you doing people a favor because you do, you're a great photographer. You're a great photographer, you recognize as one and people give you respect, give you work because of that. But the bigger thing they're doing is they're, you know, they're placing faith in your, in your expertise to be able to give 
a face to their brand and their service, and it's a much larger issue out there thereafter. So understand that. So anyway, so that's that's what it was as far as I'm concerned. So Usha is really special for me that way, and uh, they they have this lovely thing which they do where they you know they give a sewing machine to one lady in a particular village, and that lady in turn is trained to train other women to sew on sewing machines and some of them then end up you know making clothes for the family etc but some of them thereafter go and start businesses where from home they you know might sew clothes and sell them some of them you know set up schools uh, so i had shot well i shot in a number of other places where i'm going to show you pictures of uh, kutch which is in gujarat and in mizoram which is on the other end you know gujarat and kutch is the western end of India and the, the easternmost end is Mizoram. So, and this again, I mean, I'm, I'm, we haven't set this up. This is, you know, I was there for the three days, and whatever was the activity which is going on, this the lady on the machine is the one who is now training the others. Uh, she's the main person for the Silai machine. Uh, school in that area. And as you can see, that's the kind of embroidery and that's the kind of clothes which are, you know, famous, uh, uh, Kutch area is famous for. And once again, you know, this thing of being a street photographer, I think I value that uh, experience of how to become invisible. So even though I'm right there in this situation where uh, women normally won't even be used to having men around, uh, they don't seem to mind my presence. If you spend long enough and you know how to be unobtrusive, you know. So that's Mizoram, as you can see, that's a totally, and that's what I meant by, you know, that India is a continent which pretends to be a country. It's just so fabulously and beautifully varied and diverse and, you know, it's, it's something which we need to take great pride in and, and say that, look, we are so different in every 200 kilometers in this country. And, and Northeast especially, it's so different to the rest of the country. Because uh, yeah. I visited maybe uh, three years back, I first ventured into Northeast. I went to Nagaland. Since then, I'm in complete love with that land. I have been going yeah, again and again, exploring every single corner of that place, Assam yeah. and Arunachal and what a beautiful Arunachal place. and Mizoram. It's yeah. it's, it's uh, Meghalaya. So beautiful. Just like the parallel between India and Tanzania, here we see a parallel between <laughs> Kutch and Mizoram. The, the west of India and the east of India. Yeah. Maybe you should do one in extreme north and extreme south. One in Kerala and one mm. in Kashmir <laughs> to yeah, cover yeah, this absolutely. four corners. Well, incidentally, I did shoot in part of this project. I was also shooting in Kerala. Oh, okay. Uh, but I, I haven't shown the pictures here. I don't think they're on the website either. Okay. It's a wonderful thing that they're doing. Yeah. Okay. If I may, I don't think you would ask for this question, but we, when we had a conversation earlier, we talked about uh, doing other CSR work, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is something very special for me. I just wanted to share this small photo sure, sure, essay. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had photographed this for uh, Oxfam, which is an NGO, uh, which does a lot of work in the education and health area, and so they were doing a story. On... Minute, yeah? I'll be Sorry? back in one minute. Sure. Okay. Do you want me to wait? I think you can carry on. Okay, I just have a sip of water and I carry yeah, on. Yeah, sure, sure. So, 
so they approached me to do a story uh, on education and i knew of a place called pragati wheel school which is actually a school which doesn't even have a building uh, for anyone who knows delhi and there's a river called yamuna which flows on the side of delhi uh, this school has been set up by someone i know is a distant relative of uh, my family uh, and he's been running the school for the labor and farmers who live in that area uh, who live in you know just small huts etc who grow vegetables on the banks of the river because it's very fertile soil uh, but generally are you know are poor and don't have the facilities or the resources to send their kids to proper schools so what the school has done is that they set up a kind of a temporary situation where the kids come and they are you know from nursery school till i think class 3 they are taught over there uh the interesting thing is that the school is set up every morning by the children and then dismantled by the children every afternoon and put away so this is the story of how that happens so like i was saying the this is the children of people who work as farmers who grow vegetables on the side of on the banks of the yamuna and they sell them either on the highway next to the uh, river or in the mandis which are close by so they live in these huts these one of the students of the school getting ready to go to school and so there is this one tent in which all the furniture of the school is placed every afternoon after the school is over so in the morning all the chairs and the tables and the desk etc and the and the dadis and the carpets everything is stored here so the kids come in the morning and in the back out of focus area where you see the goats that's the area where the school is actually set up so as the kids arrive whoever arrives walks to the uh, tent where the furniture is kept and some of them pick up the jharus so that they will go and sweep the area in which the school is to be set up so you know some one child will pick up one dari you know someone will pick up a chair so they are cleaning up the area so that they can set up the school there and of course in the summer and you know rainy season then they use these tarpaulins to so that the school that there can be a bit of shade under which the students can sit so all the kids do this themselves the whiteboard is set up on the wall and that's the assembly and it's run like a regular school okay now the other thing of course what the uh, the people who are running the school do the teachers are all qualified teachers they are all beds they all have the proper degrees and everything they are given proper salaries all the children are given uniforms uh, which are from funds generated by the ngo themselves and books and also midday meal so that's the classroom in the foreground under the tarpaulin and that's the assembly in the back and on the left is the is a bridge to the yamuna so that's your classroom that's how the classes happen uh, is a pipeline in the background or something yeah it's it's uh, so that's the we it's next to the river so that okay. would be the water works the the wall on the right which you see is one of the water pumping plants uh, from uh, and this uh, pipeline is going into that and you know it's the water which is being fed towards uh, the east of delhi just the 2% uh, budget from that pipeline could have been put to make a school for these kids <laughs> see it actually there was a time when there used to be some kind of a temporary sheds and all were there for the school and they used to be there uh, then the asian games came along and uh, this is very close to where the asian village the games village was built Uh, it's barely two kilometers away, so the Delhi government cleared up this entire area to beautify it, etc. You know, they, they thought this looked like too shabby, etc. So after the games, instead of letting the school come back, they said, "No, you can't. You don't have a license to run a school, and uh, this is public land, so you can't build a, a structure here." And 
if these kids want to go, go and study, they can go and study in government schools. And the problem is that the nearest government school is three, four kilometers away. And where are these little kids going to go? And the parents are the kinds who don't have the time. I mean, they work in the fields and then they go to the market to sell the produce, you know. So that's why the school is being run there. And I heard the Commonwealth, uh, whatever they built, the infrastructure, is now in mm -hmm. decay, right? Nothing yeah. is made. At least give that to these people. <laughs> it will be a beautiful school. It will be a university. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, oh. yeah. that's India's <laughs> problems. Yeah. yeah. So here again, I spent an entire morning because I wanted to tell the story of how the school is literally built by the uh, kids every morning. They get the education and they dismantle the school and go away. It's an everyday thing. I mean, can you imagine little kids of six, seven, five? So much of spirit. Yeah. yeah. But because of the you know dedication and sincerity of the person who's running it and the teachers who are teaching them, I mean, they are they're like kids of any school. I mean, they're as interested and as involved and as committed to learning as any other child would be. These kids will never fail in their life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's part of the midday meal. Each of them get a glass full or a bowl full of milk along with the food. And uh, the time of shooting there, they also, like every other school does, they have an annual day and they keep doing these little you know, plays and skits and what have you. And, and the NGO provides for you know, all the costumes and stuff so that the kids feel like they're going to a regular school, you know, even if it's just on the banks of the river. And if I may just read out this, education and the pursuit of knowledge is the key to opportunity and equality in the modern world. India has to recognize this if we wish to become a truly fair and equitable society. Pragati Wheel School is doing its bit to further this endeavor. And I think they're doing an absolutely marvelous job of it. It's truly wonderful because uh, just uh, two days back, we had uh, Altaf uh, Kadri, the photojournalist. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know him. He has, a man. A, yeah, he has a project very similar to this in Delhi yes. under a flyover. Yes, under, under a flyover. Yeah, yeah he's been so, I mean, that. so wonderful how these things operate despite all the you know, yeah. social injustice. The indomitable uh, human spirit. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, we're almost coming to the conclusion of uh, this session. And uh, one of the questions that I had was mothers and daughters. It's a beautiful series of wonderful images uh, shot in a very studio set up with a nice light and perfect postures and etc. Right now that we are all stuck at home, we don't know, maybe it continues for another few months, who knows. So uh, as photographers, we can't sit still. And I think this is something that can inspire all of us to shoot people in our homes, you know, maybe our family. In my case, I just have a cat, so I have very little options. But most of you may be staying with your family and, uh, you know, maybe you could utilize and get inspired and shoot your family the way uh, Dinesh has done in this project. Yeah, so can you please take us through this thought process? Sure. Okay, if I can just uh, take a minute explaining the background to this. Yeah. Uh, I have two sisters and the only son, so, as I was growing up, there were women around me and I have two daughters. So my life has been full of women and I think the, the world would be a far better place if it was run by women. Unfortunately, it's not as run by men and which is why we in the mess we are in. But anyway, that's something which hopefully will get corrected in the years and centuries to come. Uh, so for me, this is my homage or my ode to women in my life. Uh, I've been photographing you know, whether they are friends, whether they're family, whether they're friends of friends. Uh, it started off by only shooting uh, someone who's a cousin of my wife. And she'd asked me to do a portrait of her and a daughter and a mother. And uh, I told them that, look, come to my studio and I like to do a formal portrait. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because I feel that ever since digital came along and especially the camera phone, the, the you know, the the majesty of the studio portrait has been lost. Uh, and I'd, I love that particular process. I love the output. I love those formal portraits. So I wanted to do this project really in the more classical studio form against one particular background with studio lights so that there was the only thing which was changing within the photographs from the series of mothers and daughters I photographed 
were the women and their chemistry and the relationship and not any other information about what kind of homes they have, what kind of curtains they have, what kind of sofas they have. Uh, so that's what this is about. So it's formal. My only condition is that you come to my studio, I'll photograph you there. And it's about women who I think are the most magnificent uh, race on earth. Here we go. So as you'll see that there is, you know, different people and different families have a different relationship, different chemistry, different way of expressing. Uh, and that's what I wanted to capture on these photographs. Uh, as Subodh rightly said, you can do this with your own family nowadays. I have a painted backdrop. You could use curtains, you know, you could use bed sheets. Uh, you could even use your regular wall or, you know, just one corner of your house. nice to see the chemistry some are very intellectual some are very friendly some are very yeah it's it's you know some are very formal some formal are very yeah. touchy and you know okay if i just may add one more thing here is that i you know this entire process happens over a hour two hours depending on how much time people have and the though it's a classical studio situation uh, taken from how it used to be done in the 30s and 40s but the advantage is that i use a digital camera and as I shoot, I can keep showing the picture to the women I'm photographing. So it becomes, in a way, a collaborative effort. They know what I'm seeing, they know what I'm photographing, and they in turn are then responding, you know, and get a bit more open, get a bit more comfortable. These are not models, you know, they're not used to being in front of the camera. They're most probably being in a studio for the first time in their lives. Uh, so it takes a little while for, you know, them to just feel more at ease with me, with the process. Uh, and that's how we end up getting such marvelous photographs then. That incidentally is my mom, my elder sister and her daughter. <laughs> you know, like, though it is classical portraiture, but I also love the fact that I, I, I want to capture whatever is the equation between the women, you know. Some just keep cracking, you know, jokes and keep cracking up. You know, it's 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 really fun. Uh, you know, normally the is the grandmother who's the the calmest and the most serene, and you know, it's just it's just, just so beautiful. Incidentally, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, on the on the left corner, the blue uh, kurta is Oshima Narayan, fabulous photo photographer. She used to be the photo editor of National Geographic Traveler in India. Oh, okay. And those are her daughters, and her mom, and her sister. We should get her on the show. <laughs> huh? <laughs> we should bring her on the show one day. Yeah, you should. You should. Huh. She's yeah. so good. Yeah. She's fabulous. And this. I mean, you know, so I told That's Oshima, she said, no, I want to be part of the series. And I said, listen, you're a photographer. I'd be too nervous to shoot for you. So no, too bad. You have to. I'm coming to Delhi. She lives in Bombay. I'm going to be there for two days. So I'm coming over. So anyway, so I did, you know, and so he shot Oshima. In this photograph, the lady in the front is Manjari Chaturvedi. She's a Kathak dancer. She's Amit Mehra's wife. Amit Mehra is a very good photographer. The lady in the back, standing up in the white kurta is... Bandeep Singh's wife. Bandeep is the photo editor of India Today. Mm. So I, I told uh, Manjuri is a good friend and said, this, what do you mean I'll, photo I, I'll be too bloody nervous, you know, photographing the wives of two of such <laughs> fabulous photographers, you know, they'll always find fault in the picture. I, I said, we don't care. We want to be part of the series and we are coming over. You have to photograph us. The other lovely thing in this photograph is if you see on the left, there's a frame with a picture in it. Uh, they were actually four sisters. One of them, unfortunately, had passed away a few years earlier and they thought, so how do we, we want her to be part of the picture. So how do we do that? So we came across this idea that why don't you get a frame photograph and we put that on the side so that she becomes a part of the entire portrait. Then. There's a movie uh, called uh, um, Kapoor and Sons. It's a Hindi yeah, movie. Yeah. In that, there is a scene where they photograph and 
things never work out and finally something yeah, like yeah. this happens where a person passes away and it's a beautiful film with it shows the importance of a photograph yeah but again okay, i think uh, yeah so if i may just uh, we didn't talk about this and this not in your questions but since your question had to do with what you can do in this lockdown yeah, kind of yeah. sector i just wanted to so that's what people can do is take portraits of their family i just wanted to share a few pictures about what i am doing uh, mm. uh like i said earlier i am a compulsive obsessive photographer and my most favorite camera is the phone camera i photograph all the time everywhere anything which catches my eye and it's not all the time that i want to make any big point or whatever it is this it could be just because the light is right or the color is right or whatever it is you know and i think there's a certain reason a certain very spontaneous way that you shoot with the phone camera so in this lockdown time where as one is not allowed to but you can't hold photographers inside the houses forever so every 3 4 days i kind of slime out at 6 in the morning and go for a walk and these photographs have been shot within a 2 km radius of my house now the two things which have been playing in my mind and which i would imagine has been playing on the minds of people who are affected by the lockdown is that you know for instance gurgaon is called the millennium city is supposed to be this utopia of a modern city but right now it's almost dysfunctional it's like a dystopian utopia and so i am responding to my feelings with these photographs uh, the other is that the season is such that the trees are shedding the leaves and you know fresh leaves are coming up so i've ended up in retrospect shooting what i call stilled life which is really a play on the word still life all right so if i may just run through these photographs they've all been shot with my phone that's the way i normally go out wearing this mask i'm out to buy milk and bread from the local mother dairy that's my house uh, the reason i'm showing in this picture look at how blue the sky is you know just a few weeks of lockdown we actually for the first time and i've been living in gurgaon for 25 years finally seeing blue sky after decades let me tell you one thing yesterday was the first day i told you i went out for the first time yesterday for the beach to have a run and my house is 50 kilometers from dubai mm-hmm. and i could see burj khalifa from my beach my god imagine <laughs> yeah things are really cleared yeah, up no i i've been talking to my friends and i then we've been saying that you know maybe the government should make it mandatory every year oh, yeah to have <laughs> two <laughs> lockdowns yeah. you know this lockdown for four days and everyone seen the benefit of it and everyone should agree you know <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so this is uh, you know just the play of light. Uh, this is this huge construction site for a mall which is coming up, uh, and now of course everything is at a standstill. And I've deliberately messed up this picture because that's the feeling I'm getting from you know it's just almost like we're ravaging uh, you know the plan planet. It's uh, and. to the right of that is this this is again part of the same construction site and there is this you know pack of dogs which lives there and he got so you know startled so no one ever comes down there <laughs> so it's this is what i mean by the dystopian utopia kind of feeling you know it looks like end of uh, the world <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and you know the colony near my house which is at a standstill Uh, this table in the front is a chap who makes keys he's a key maker and he's obviously not been there for the last few weeks he has been wonder what's happening with his life you know he's a key maker in lockdown yeah <laughs> so <clears throat> now this i thought was so emblematic of you know your wheels have come to a halt you know your <laughs> businesses have shut down it's uh... so here the point i want to make here that you know uh, look at photography as a way of expressing these are streams of consciousness kind of pictures you know they don't have a purpose they are not going to a contest they're not for an assignment they're just my feelings about what's happening today you know and i'm looking for a physical representation for a feeling of uh, you know what's going through my mind and it's turning out to be a good assignment and the end you know it will turn out to be a beautiful it's a, sort of picture i so. like you rightly said you know i just have i don't even look at them as series it's just that you know i get obsessed with certain things and it's not that i get obsessed with one thing i at any given time the five or six 
So it's streams of consciousness which are running through my day, uh, in which one day I'll find kursis, one day I'll find something like this. It's, uh, you know, the dogs are wondering whether all the humans have gone. <laughs> I was reading that their psyche is changing. All the street dogs, within these months of lockdown, their whole way of dealing with things are changing yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah. I have two dogs at home and I, we, we've been talking about it. That You know, whether they, they love us being at home, but the fact that we're home all the time is also kind of freaking them out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, why aren't they going anywhere? Are these people constantly here? <laughs> you know? My cat would sleep next to me, uh, but now she's not. She's hiding away from me. Uh, mm. So this is what I was talking about. You know, this is you know spring turning to summer, and this is just things which I'm finding on the road, and I'm shooting with my phone, and I'm messing around with Snapseed, and you know whatever other thing I have. I shoot with Hipstamatic. Yeah, that shot with the Hipstamatic. It's almost like the way we left mm. yeah, when we went in. <laughs> So these are, you know, these are these are feelings. These are not, you know, what people say. Oh, so what is the sign? There's no significance. If you find some feeling in the picture, it's it's I've communicated to you. If you don't, too bad. Look at someone else's picture. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's okay. <laughs> but it's like you know, I'm, I'm finding still life on the street, on the road, on the tarmac. It's it's uh, they, these are patterns of nature. They're not on my making. I'm not setting it up. I'm not putting it together. This is. It, I love finding things. I love finding photographs. It's, it's a uh, beautiful image. Yeah. yeah so. Could easily be cover of a book. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Coming to the last part, uh, the reason why I kept Banaras as the last part is because it's very, very special. Uh, anyone who goes to uh, Varanasi, they know they will go back again and again and again. That's how it works. You know, there are a lot of people who have come on my workshops and they've repeated these trips to Varanasi. It's a very, very special place. And uh, my photography began with Ladakh and Varanasi as the very first uh, travel destinations. And since then, I have no count how many times I've been to Varanasi and it's such a special place. And I read that you've been going there for the last 10 years and may maybe more, more. 21 times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, I'm not even surprised that you're going there so many times because it's such a wonderful place. So I would like to conclude with Banaras and uh, your thoughts behind your images. Okay, Banaras actually have been going for the last 30 years. The first 10 years worth of travel, some of these pictures found their way into both Bazaar and Living Faith. But ever since we went digital, so from about 2006 when I, you know, went digital, uh, I've been going there and somehow that became you know, a kind of a separate era. It became the digital era of street photography for me. Uh, and by that time, about 2000, 2006, I felt that I'd already been traveling so much and I don't want to travel all the time. And somehow Banaras is a place which draws me and more importantly, it makes me feel that everything which I love about India, I can find in Banaras. Absolutely. Everything I hate about India, I find in Banaras. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything which is charming about India is there. Everything which is irritating about India is there. Uh, so, for me, Banaras is like a microcosm of India. And I thought I, it was not a conscious thought. It's just that I found that I was going there again and again. So, since 2006 till 2020, that's 14 years, I've been there uh, more than 25 times now. Uh, and... In between the times when I've not gone for a year, then would the other times when I go for about three visits within six months, whatever it is. So there's no pattern, there's no conscious effort. It's again a stream of consciousness kind of a thing. It's just a place which engages me, it's a place which repels me, all of that. All right. so anyway, so the but what I'm going to show you and what if at all this ever turns into a self-published book, uh, which I hope it will one day. Uh, I see the title of that being Every Day in Eternity. The reason for that is Banaras, as some of you might know, is known as the eternal city. It's always been there. Uh, so that's why the word eternity. But at the same time, Banaras, even though it's special for Hindus, it's a great pilgrimage center, what have you, 
and has a very different way of life, but it's also has a very everyday, I mean, every city, every colony, every family has a very everyday life also. So within that spectacle, within that, you know, large crowds and within all that, I look for that every day. I look for that every day moment or that, you know, everyday experience, uh, which is particular and special to Banaras, but is a very everyday thing there. So that's what these photographs are about. So I, I, I love this. This is my canvas. I love crowds. I love the color. I love the fact that there's so many people. But within this, I look for that one moment, that one person, you know, who is in their own communion, with their own faith, with their own God. For me, that's what is special. Like this. So the challenge as a photographer of finding these moments when there are hundreds of people around to be able to isolate that. And also my deep respect for people's faith in the faith they have. The funny moments, you know, they are. Tender moments. The pilgrims are so special. They might be whatever they are in their places, wherever they live, but when they come here, there's a separate, there's a different energy they have, there's a different feeling they have. As if you've been to Banaras recently, or you might have read about this, there's a part of, uh, you know, the ghats and houses there, which lead from the river to the main temple, which has been broken down so that a boulevard and, you know, one... The corridor office, project. Yeah. yeah, the corridor project. So this is, you know, I was there, Manish and Vinay had taken me. You, uh, so both you must be knowing them, right? Yeah, I know. Manish Khatri and uh, yeah. Vinay, I mean, they are like my younger brothers for me. So they take me around and show me all these different it's a very, places. very important uh, place to shoot, in my opinion, because recently I yeah. was there with my group and I was telling them, capture whatever you can, because this is a very, very important moment, because you won't see this again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, the famous German Baba. <laughs> mm. oh. Thank you, oh. thank you for your patience, thank you for your time, thank you for your attention. Let me just escape from here and uh, no. go back to Zoom. Where